covering the high plains with news, weather, and information. From TV23 Studios in Sublet, this is High Plains Today. Hi, everybody. Welcome to this special edition of High Plains Today. I'm joined in studio today by Dr. Roger Marshall. He is a Republican from Great Bend, and he is running for the U.S. House of Representatives, District 1, or the Big First, whichever you prefer. Thanks for coming by today, Doc. Chris, I'm excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Good afternoon, everybody. He's ready to go, too, I'm telling you. All right. I want to, the first thing I want to start out with, though, is, you know, it's right there on your, your web page, on your Facebook page. You're not a politician. Why are you running for Congress? You're right, Chris. I'm not a politician. <laughs> I'm, I'm a physician. And um, over the past 25 years, I've delivered over 5,000 babies. But, but the reason I'm running is this. Uh, we had our first grandchild almost two years ago. And for several years, people have been asking me to run for Congress. My wife kept telling them, no, 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 he's not going to run. Uh, but after we had the, grand, the grandson, we had the conversation of, what are we going to be when we grow up? And the conversation turned to, are we leaving it better than we found it? Leaving this world, this country better than we found it. And after four more years of President Obama, I'm afraid we weren't leaving it better than we found it. And my wife looked at me and she said, you like to fix things. It's time to go to Washington. There you go. There you go. I like that. She kept saying, no, he's, no, he's not running. But now you are. Yes, sir. We are. We're in this. You're running hard, too. We're running hard. We're in this all the way. We're in it to win it. All right. Let me ask you this. So you brought up President Obama, especially the last four years. Being a physician, let's touch a little bit on, on Obamacare and, and health programs in this country. Oh. I mean, what are your thoughts there? The, the Affordable Care Act has been the ruin of my life for the past five years. It has been the, the worst thing I've ever done professionally. Um, in my own office, we used to have two nurses. Now we have five nurses to see the same number of patients. Over the next year, more physicians are going to quit medicine across this country than ever before, mostly because they're sick of the Affordable Care Act. It's creating hours and hours of us staring at screens rather than talking to our patients. Really? Yes, sir. That's tough. So it's, it's you know, everybody claims about the claims of it's being better for everybody in the, in the United States and are able to get affordable health care, but it's put more of a burden on doctors, hospitals, caregivers, all those types of things with more red tape, more paperwork? Exactly. So... At the end of the day, there's still thousands and millions of patients that are uninsured or underinsured. The quality of health care is not improved, and, and costs are skyrocketing, in particular in pharmacies. If anyone's bought any medications lately, they know that the pharmacies have went up exponentially since the Affordable Care Act. So how can we still have millions of people, though, that are still uninsured? Because that, that was the big selling point of the Affordable Care Act was everybody would have affordable health insurance. Right. Even though it's mandatory, and I would like to get rid of that mandate along with the whole thing. I'd like to repeal the whole thing, mainly to get rid of the mandate, and because it's killing rural hospitals, and we can talk more about it. But it's so complicated that patients don't know how to get it, and um, the, the deductibles are so high that even though they're insured, they're underinsured. And for whatever reason, there's still millions of people that never have gotten health insurance. I can't explain why, but I would just say it's because it's so complicated. Well, in rural hospitals, especially in, in the first district and all of western Kansas, I mean, rural hospitals are a big thing out here. Well, and you know that being in Great Bend, right? Absolutely. I mean, because you can, I guess you could call Great Bend a rural hospital. I, I call every hospital in my district rural um, compared to an inner city hospital and. And the, the biggest reason I would want to repeal the Affordable Care Act is it's decreasing Medicare reimbursement for hospitals. And guess what our hospitals in rural Kansas are full of? Medicare patients. So the president is paying for his Medicaid expansion by decreasing Medicare reimbursement for hospitals. It, his plan disproportionately helped inner city hospitals who have a disproportionate share of Medicaid patients. I hope that's not too complicated, but the big problem is it decreases Medicare reimbursement for hospitals. That's a mess. Yes. Well, and it's always been a mess, but then you've got the other side of things saying, no, no, the Affordable Care Act works. We brought insurance, we brought everything to these people. 
but not so much in rural Kansas. It's not working. I don't think it's working across the entire country. Um, man, federal mandates have never been shown to work. Um, it's not, it does not help keep the cost of health care down. Actually, people's insurances are going up, I think, an average about 12, 18 percent. So it just it hasn't worked. One more example of government overregulation not working, letting the, rather than letting private enterprise supply and demand rule the day. All right, and I've read a lot of stuff that you said. I mean, you are a, a proponent for less government. Yes. Okay. All right. While we're on health care, something that kind of ties into that, some people claim that you are not a pro-life candidate. Which is just crazy. I mean, I'm not sure what else I could do. Um, I'm 150% pro-life. I've never done an abortion. I could never do an abortion. I've helped hundreds of girls adopt their babies out. I've made sure they had free health care, both as a physician and in the hospital. I helped reach out to Catholic Social Services. I helped get them a proper legal advice as well. And my office is known for adoption. We've literally saved hundreds, if not thousands, of babies' lives. I'm the doctor that when all the other doctors tell you you should abort your baby, that the patients come to me so I can help take care of them. Um, it just I just have no idea why a person could say such a horrible thing about another person. Okay, so quick, you know, we're going to take a break here in about 30 seconds. But where did all that come from? Because you're a member of the OBGYN, whatever, uh, I forget what the association is. The American College of Obstetricians is my professional association. Okay. And it would be next to impossible to practice medicine to keep my board certification without being a member of that. But what people are forgetting, they don't realize, is that, that my opponent has accepted $27,000 of Washington, D.C. money from associations that support Planned Parenthood and other pro-abortion groups. Um, it's, it's, I'm not proud that ACOG has given funding towards them, and I, but I've been able to fight from inside. I think I have a louder voice fighting from within than from without. Okay. All right. Now that we've covered health care and your pro-life and while you, why you're running for Congress, Hold that thought. Stay right there, because when we come back, I want to ask you about agriculture, okay? Looking forward to it. All right. Thanks. Stay right there. We'll be back with Dr. Marshall and more right after this. You're watching High Plains Today on TV23 with host Chris Jewell. TV23 internet service and 4G live streaming provided by... United Wireless, coverage you deserve, service you expect, United Wireless. And welcome back. My special guest today, Dr. Roger Marshall, is a Republican from Great Bend. He is running for the U.S. House of Representative District 1. Man, that's a lot to say. The big first. The big first. That's easy. The big first, it? 63 counties. I know. Takes that's about a bunch. six hours. I'm in Sublette this morning. I'll be in uh, Emporia tomorrow. <laughs> And then all the way up to Marysville. I was going to say, it goes, yeah, there's, it's big. It's big. Okay, we were talking about affordable health care, all that kind of stuff. But I want to touch on one other thing that is probably one of the larger things, well, in the state of Kansas. Let's talk about agriculture. Now, right now, in the House of Representatives in Washington, we have no representation on the, on the Ag Committee. That's correct. That's not good. Is it? It's, it's horrible. <laughs> it's, they're discussing the next farm bill right now as we speak, and we have no voice in Washington from the biggest sorghum-producing district in the, in the entire country, from the breadbasket of the, of the world, from, the, from a state that has more cattle than people. And we don't have representation on the House Ag Committee for the first time in, in modern history. So how does that happen? Well, that's a good question. You'll have to ask the, uh, my opponent to ask him why he got kicked off the House Ag Committee before that, he got kicked off the House Budget Committee. And before that, he got kicked off Topeka for the State Ways and Means Committee. Um, I think it's because of a lack of respect. It's a lack of an ability to get along and play well with others. Now, you have said, now he has said, though, that he plans on being back on the Agriculture Committee if he's reelected. But either way, you don't see that happening. I think the chances of him getting back on the House Ag Committee are next to nothing. He's getting no support out of Washington. The, the silence is almost deafening out of Washington. And what he doesn't tell you is even Speaker Boehner even gave him a chance to get back on the House Ag Committee, but the steering committee shot him down. 
He has one vote out of 30 votes on that steering committee. And unfortunately, he may be the only person that votes for himself. Uh, he, he just has no chance of getting back on the House Ag Committee. I'm not trying to be mean. I'm not trying to be cruel. But, our, but Kansans deserve to know that. And it's just a gamble we can't let our children take. So how would you represent the state of Kansas, especially western Kansas out here, on the Agriculture Committee if, if elected? Sure. I think I'm a person that grows relationship, that grows rapport with other people. I'm, I'm, I'm a leader. I'm an effective conservative leader that grows rapport by listening to other people, getting to know them and respecting their point of view. I'm going to have a great relationship with all the, the so, agriculture associations. I already been endorsed by Kansas Farm Bureau, by the Kansas Livestock Association, Dairy Farmers of America, sorghum, uh, corn, ethanol, and the big announcement today is that wheat, for the first time ever, is supporting somebody uh, in a primary election. So I'm gonna have great relationships with those people, listening to them. I've always thought that people that are being regulated uh, should have some input on, on the situation, and from them will come the solutions. That's a lot of ag. That's a lot of agriculture-related endorsements. Yes, we've got all the major agriculture endorsements now uh, across the state. I think that speaks volumes about what uh, agriculture thinks of my opponent. And and uh, we we've, we've been over to over 50 county farm bureau meetings. That we've been in a dozen feedlots, three big dairies, uh, just. Dozens and dozens of farm operations. We have our finger on the pulse of agriculture. You're getting out and getting your feet dirty then, aren't you? We have gotten, <laughs> gotten a plenty dirty. Yeah, You're out there chasing through the stockyards. Okay. You know, I, I used to work at a cell barn growing up, so I visited several uh, cell mm -hmm. barns, and I always kind of laugh when people say, oh, this work's too hard for me to do. And uh, I, I say, well, there's not a job in the big first I haven't done. I grew up working in agriculture, uh, working at a cell barn, working on a family farm, and I've continued to be very heavily invested and interested in agriculture now. Feeding cattle, part of an agriculture bank. I understand agribusiness. Agriculture is no longer the farm you and I grew up on. It is big business. It's high gamble, high stakes, high rewards. Well, not too much high rewards right now. We've kind well, of yeah, suffered some Well, yeah, depending on commodities. the markets on where they We've are. We've had yes. a bad year here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because I don't think people realize that, you know, we're still producing more and more in agricultural commodities. But the number of farms in Kansas and in the United States is going down. Yes. So that only tells you one thing, that farms are getting bigger and bigger. They are. So it's just and, the way and it people is. have to steer towards that. Whether we like it or not, I mean, you know, that's just the way things are going. There's a, a lot of market dic dictating that situation. The uh, capital cost uh, for some of this equipment now is just horribly expensive and it's just impossible to have a small farm with small operations anymore. Okay, we got about a minute before we're going to take another break. Let's touch on, since we're in agriculture and, fam and farms and those types of things, what about the EPA? The, the, biggest, I mean, the biggest concern that, that farmers have, that agriculture has, just not farmers, cattlemen, dairies, is the EPA and overregulation. And, and Chris, what I think I can do is I think I can go to Washington and what I would do is share a story with a person that's never been to a farm, a congressman or a woman from New Jersey and say, my grandfather's built terraces 50, 60, 70 years ago and now the government's wanting to regulate the water running off of it. It makes no sense. They, they, they had, had great sound uh, soil conservation practices and now we're being punished by it. Yeah, a terrace is not a navigable Dream, is it the water running it's, off it's of it? It's not. I got to visit, sit down with Senator <laughs> Dole about a month ago and had a wonderful heart-to-heart -heart conversation. He wrote the original Waters of the U.S. rules uh, and that legislation, and specifically, he, he told me what um, a navigable stream was, and he did not intend uh, little water running off of it. wasn't water running off of a terrace, was no, it? No, it was not. All right. It was not. Okay. Stick around, because I'm coming back with Dr. Marshall, and we're going to talk about some more stuff. We're going to talk about immigration and some other things that are big topics right now. We'll be right back. And here we are. We're back. Dr. Roger Marshall, Republican candidate, U.S. House of Representatives, the big first. All right. Now, we've touched on pro-life. We've touched on Obamacare. We've talked about agriculture. We even got the EPA in there. But some other big issues, though, that are really hitting the country right now are national security, immigration, and I guess you could throw the Second Amendment into all that, too. I mean, those three pretty much all kind of revolve around each other, I think. 
Sounds good. So, so immigration, where, where are we at on that? I mean, what are, you, what are your feelings or your thoughts on immigration? Right. Reform. <laughs> We've got to yeah. have it. Yeah. Yeah. Chris, I've worked really hard on this one. Um, when I started out this process, I didn't think I had all the answers to immigration, but I think I do have a pretty good policy worked out. So often politicians look at problems in little silos, but immigration is a complex problem. It's first and foremost a national security problem, but it's also an economic problem. It's a social problem. It's a school issue down here as well. So you can't just look at it just as by itself. And after having visited dozens of, of feedlots and big dairies and farm operations, people need to realize that we have 20,000 open jobs in this state. Think what our economy would be like if we had 20,000 more taxpayers in this state helping to pay for education and roads again. So here's my, here's my, uh, my policy. First and foremost, we need to secure the border. We need to secure it. Uh, and second of all, we need to enforce the laws of, my, of the land. My dad was the chief of police in El Dorado for 25 years. He taught me to respect the law. And we need to enforce the laws that we have. We, I don't believe in sanctuary cities. I think if, a, if an immigrant is here and commits a crime, they're done. There's no strikes two and three. You're done. But finally, what we need is a simpler work visa program. What I was shocked to find out as I asked people, why do people circumvent the situation? Why do they not come through the right way? And people told me it takes four to five to six to seven years to get a work visa card in this, in this uh, country. That's not right. Okay. Now, but so, now, let's talk about pathway to citizenship because, I mean, I don't know. Some people have said that you're in favor of a pathway to citizenship. Right? Wrong? Otherwise? That's wrong. Once again, okay. my, my opponent trying to speak for me, my opponent wants to tell other people what Roger Marshall believes in. But I have never said that I'm in favor of a pathway to anything. What I'm in favor of is a work simpler work visa program. Now, you're not going to hear me talk about gathering all the people and putting them on a train and shipping them back to Mexico. I don't think Kansas can afford that. Uh, but it's really interesting how my opponents pivoted to exactly my plan. I've, been having, I've said this same plan now for a year, but you go back and listen to what he was talking about about six months ago, a year ago, and now he's pivoted to exactly what I'm talking about. A simple plan. Uh, professional politicians make the simple complicated, but leaders make the complicated simple. Well, plagiarism is kind of a form of flattery. Thank isn't you. It? it sure is. It sure is. <laughs> All right. What about now And in Kansas? And the Southwest in general, I mean, the Second, second Amendment, you know, oh, holy ground. hot topic, hot topic. Yeah. You know, I love the Second Amendment. It's about this long. It's a real short, <laughs> short one. And I'm a lifetime member of the NRA. I've sat down and visited with the NRA. They said they would give me an A-plus rating. We're still waiting for that official word from them. Uh, so I'm a lifetime member. I'm not sure if my opponent's even a member of the NRA. Okay, so we know you're in favor of that. All right, now... We got about two minutes left. Okay. I want you to go crazy on me on national security, where you stand on that, because that is going to be no matter who is elected president in November, <laughs> yes, sir. is going to be a big deal in yes. Washington. Yes, it was hard for me to believe this, Chris, but I started this process about two years ago as Rotary District Governor, and no one was talking about national security as I was touring the cities and listing, and then about a year and a half ago. When I sit down and have a cup of coffee with anybody, Kansans were concerned about national security. Before Paris happened, before Orlando happened, before any of this happened, my Kansas moms knew that something was up and they didn't feel safe anymore. I spent seven years in the Army Reserve. I did special training for Desert Storm. I understand the culture of the Middle East. We need to declare war on radical Islam. We need to untie the armies and the military's hands and let them do their job. It's about that simple. So how would we accomplish that when you get to Washington, especially if the Democrats win the White House? I mean, how is that going to happen? Well, that'll be tough. If, if, if we need to get the right president, for, for any policy to move forward, we need a different president. We need this country to go in a different direction. And that's why I'll support anyone whose name is not Hillary. We're definitely behind Mr. Trump. Uh, we think he'll be a, a very solid president. I think he's going to turn this country in a different direction. 
what Congress can do is, vote, is literally vote to declare war on radical Islam. It'll change the, our, our laws and what they can do with uh, people. I think several of these incidents would have been prevented if we would have already declared war uh, on radical Islam. So, okay. Now, we got about, what, 30 seconds left, I think, Brian? Okay. What do you want to close with? you got about 30 seconds. Okay. It's yours. Okay. Go for it. Yeah. People often ask me the biggest differences between myself and my opponent, and certainly uh, the ability to get back on the House Ag Committee is a big deal. Funding national security is a big deal. Growing jobs and health care. I can help fix all those things. But the, the biggest difference between the opponent and myself is I am a peacemaker. Since I've been 10 years old, my brother's called me Henry Kissinger. I have the ability to bring people together to solve problems. I will bring effective conservative leadership back to Kansas again. All right, Dr. Marshall, I appreciate you coming by today. This was interesting. I got to learn a lot about you today. I've enjoyed it, Chris. Thanks All for right. having me. And that's it. That's it for today. Thanks for tuning in to this special edition of High Plains Today. We'll see you next time. the date with the latest information from TV 23 on our Facebook page, KDGL TV.